All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to listen to our lovely talk on how we're doing stateful uh, LinkedIn on Kubernetes. So before we get started, a little bit about us. I'm a staff engineer at LinkedIn. I've been at LinkedIn for about five years now. For the first three and a half years, I worked on all things commerce at LinkedIn. So if you ever bought something on LinkedIn, premium, uh, I touched that. And then for the next, for the last one and a half years, I've been working on all the goodies that you're going to see in this talk. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Zhang Tong. I am a software engineer from one of uh, LinkedIn's data infrastructure teams. Uh, the team manages LinkedIn's um, document store, and we are the pilot application, the pilot stateful application on Kubernetes at LinkedIn. Um, really excited to be here to share our experience about running stateful applications on top of Kubernetes. Yeah. Oh, wrong way. So, uh, what are we going to talk about today? Just a small overview of sort of where we started and how we arrived to the solution that we're going to present today. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about cooperation with the application cluster managers. Uh, we'll talk a bit about what our operator actually looks like, what it does. Uh, we'll talk about host lifecycle maintenance, some of the lessons learned, acknowledgments, and some Q&A at the end. Oh. Uh, all right, uh, let's start with uh, the problem we are trying to solve. So uh, at LinkedIn, we run quite a few stateful applications. For example, we have Kafka for stream processing. We have uh, our graph database. And of course, we have the document store, which is one of the stateful applications at LinkedIn. So uh, on the legacy computer infrastructure, uh, each of these stateful applications operates in their own private pool of nodes. The applications run on bare metal machines, uh, each team have developed like uh, numerous uh, automations and toolings to manage their workloads uh, to handle things like scaling, maintenance, and so on. So uh, if you compare the automation tooling developed by each team, it's easy to see that uh, they have great similarities. For example, they um, use the same set of APIs from the computer infrastructure. They perform similar tasks. So basically, like every team is reinventing, uh, reinventing wheel. Uh, on the other hand, uh, despite all the automation and the tooling developed by, uh, by teams, we still hit limits, uh, especially with big operations like tech refresh. This kind of operations uh, usually requires collaboration between the hardware team and the application team, which makes it so hard to fully automate. Uh, so given all these pain points, uh, it's clear that like, um, we want a more modern and unified computer infrastructure. So given that you know, we had this toil, we decided we want to sort of reinvent our stack. So we sort of started to build our next generation compute infrastructure at LinkedIn. So we have on one side the infrastructure as a service platform. So on this side, it is completely decoupled from Kubernetes. It is not Kubernetes aware. And it basically sits on top of the data center. And you can see all the high level components, maintenance management, host health management, quota management, all of these goodies that you'd expect from a compute layer. And then on top of that, we actually layer Kubernetes. So we have a hub and spoke model where we have a hub cluster that sort of manages all of the work clusters. And so the way we scale Kubernetes at LinkedIn is actually we just scale out our work clusters. And the hub cluster just helps us manage that. So given that we're using Kubernetes, we still had the problem of how on earth are we going to actually run the stateful workloads on Kubernetes, right? And so you know, there's a lot of problems with running stateful workloads on Kubernetes. So the first big problem we have at LinkedIn is that we don't actually use network-attached storage for a lot of our workloads. So historically at LinkedIn, network-attached storage could not meet the latency requirements of um, serving stateful applications. So, most of you guys today, if you're running a stateful application, you have some network attached storage. If you're going to lose a node, unmount that thing. You mount it on a new node. Congrats. Like, life is great. Um, for our use case, we're running mostly on local SSDs. And so I cannot call a data center technician and ask them, please unplug the SSD and put it into another host. Uh, it's not scalable for us. And so given if we're going to lose a node, we now have to contend with this problem of, hey, if the pod's going away and we're bringing it up on a new node, Either we have to accept that we lost the data, or we need to wait for the data to somehow come up on that node. The second problem that we have is that Kubernetes is kind of dumb, in the sense that it is not shard-aware, workload-aware. So look at this. if you look at this uh, example here, 
On the left, we have a stateful set running three pods. You don't really know what they are, and Kubernetes doesn't know what they are. And if you ask Kubernetes, hey, please take down one of these pods, for all you know, you just took down a pod from some key value store, you lost the last shard of your data, and congrats, we just took down LinkedIn. And so there's this key element of safety and like shard awareness, workload awareness that is not missing um, with stateful set or native Kubernetes. So just a quick overview, stateful set just doesn't cut it for us at LinkedIn. So the first big point is that it is not shard aware. So in that previous example, if I take down any random node, any random pod may be evicted, we'll lose the data, we may have a huge incident. Um, the other point is that given that we were gonna do a lot of host lifecycle uh, maintenance, we have a whole host lifecycle stack, um, it just doesn't flow well with stateful set. I cannot go to a stateful set and say, hey, please temporarily forget about these pods. It's just not something that's supported by stateful set. And there's other things that people ask for at LinkedIn, like, hey, I wanna run multiple canaries on a single stateful set. Um, stateful set cannot support this kind of stuff. So we needed something to bridge this gap. So typically the way this gets solved in industry today is that everyone gets an operator. So we'll have Kafka operator, TyDB operator, basically every stateful system gets an operator. And the operator, essentially, you'll have your custom resource definitions, you will have your custom business logic that will handle your scaling, your deployments, all of the goodies. And you know it's a fairly bespoke way to manage your system. Um, but it does come with a lot of drawbacks. And you know we had a lot of goals when we were doing this sort of revamp and moving on to Kubernetes. Like, we had a lot of trauma coming from that first slide where you saw all those different workflows. And if we gave everyone an operator, it, we end up basically in the, same po in the same boat where instead of a workflow, you have an operator. And if you give people, instead of all these operators, one operator with a single CRD, it's very easy now to build tooling against the one CRD. It's very easy to build a UI against the one CRD. There isn't a lot of you know, repeat work happening across LinkedIn. It's, it's much more efficient. The other thing is that we wanted to make it very, very easy to do host lifecycle maintenance. You know, we have a lot of nodes. A lot of things go wrong in the data center. So we wanted to make it seamless to actually integrate in the host lifecycle maintenance stack that we have. And the last thing is that we really wanted to abstract Kubernetes away, uh, Kubernetes away from our, our workloads. Um, Kubernetes is pretty hard. Operators are pretty hard. Every time someone writes an operator, they'll add a webhook. Every time a webhook gets added to the cluster, one of my hairs goes white. Um, so we really did not want to have people getting into the business of writing operators, potentially introducing stuff into the, into the cluster that we did not know what they were doing. Uh, we wanted to give people more abstract building blocks so they could focus more on building out application logic and not just focusing on deploying on Kubernetes. So given that we kind of wanted to go with this one operator approach, how did we sort of arrive here? So if you look at any sort of operator out in the world today, we have this notion, this like shape, where we have declared intent. There are some safety checks or business logic that's happening. And then after that, it's gonna scale in, scale out, do some version rollout, and you'll end up with some pods, some persistent volume claims. And this is sort of the general shape. And so if I ask you guys, hey, how do you make this thing generic? Just take that little piece that is different between the operators, so the safety checks is different, or the business logic is different, and move it out into its own separate microservice, right? And so now we have essentially one operator with one form of declared intent which handles your scale in, scale out, version rollout, all the node loss and disruption maintenance or host lifecycle maintenance that we have to do. And all you need to do is worry about the safety check portion here. And then we will handle the pods and persistent volume claims. So if we compare it with the first picture, instead of having everyone getting their own operator, instead we have teams just defining an entity called an LA stateful set. It comes to the stateful operator, and then teams are only responsible for, it, for writing something that we call an application cluster manager. And so that is sort of the business logic, the safety checks that would have gone in an operator, um, but instead we're having them write just a microservice instead of the operator. Um, so what exactly is an application cluster manager, or ACM? Um, on a very high level, an ACM is an independent service that orchestrates operations for a stateful application. Uh, it accepts operations from the stateful operator and makes sure those operations 
are carried out smoothly and safely. So uh, the stateful operator uh, from diagram, you can see it can send four types of requests, uh, deployment, disruption, scaling, and uh, swap. Deployment is just like rolling out a new version. Disruption temporarily removes the pod uh, while preserving their data. Um, like scaling, just like uh, add or remove pods while swap moves a pod from one node to another. So um, basically, after receiving some operations from the stateful operator, the ACM uh, performs something like a safety check, performs something like tra traffic shifting, Basically, it prepares the target pods to make it ready for the operation and then provide acknowledgments to the stateful operator. And following that, the stateful operator can do whatever needed. Um, okay, now uh, let's look into uh, the, the ACM to see uh, what is actually there. So uh, generally speaking, an ACM has three main stages to implement. Uh, the operation selection stage, operation preparation stage, and the operation completion stage. Uh, first, like we have the operation selection stage. Uh, in this stage, the ACM basically um, decides which operations should run on which parts uh, based on multiple factors like operation priority, operation type, start time, duration, and so on. Um, and uh, next is the operation preparation stage. Uh, this stage is pretty critical uh, in ACM. It performs important steps like safety check, traffic shifting, and data movement. And finally, we have the operation uh, completion stage. This is the stage where ACM wraps up operations. For example, if we had shifted traffic away from a pod in the preparation stage, this is when the ACM uh, would uh, bring traffic back. So uh, with all these abstractions, uh, the, the, the purpose is to allow applications to focus on their application-specific logics instead of worrying about like, how I need to interact with the infrastructure as a service platform or interact with Kubernetes. OK. Um, uh, here, I do want to share a, a, a real-world example of ACM. Uh, we call it Helix ACM at LinkedIn. Uh, basically, Helix, it is an open source project uh, used by many of LinkedIn's stateful applications to manage their uh, clusters, manage their instances, and manage their resource. A typical Helix-based system uh, contains three main parts. Uh, Helix as the coordinator, Zookeeper as the metadata store and the application cluster itself, which can have multiple pods, which can have multiple resources, and also each resource is replicated. So if you look at the example, uh, the cluster has four pods, four resources, like in, diff uh, in different colored rectangles, and each resource has three replicas. So uh, we will use the Helix ECM as an example uh, to see how ACM works in practice later in this talk. So from a, this is the operator that we have at a bird's eye view. So most applications at LinkedIn will only ever touch the LI stateful set entity. So the high level flow is you touch an LI stateful set and then we have a bunch of CRDs internally to help you manage, to help us manage the state. So we'll essentially, this is the high level architecture. You can see we have LI stateful set and we have operations sitting in the middle that are going to the application cluster manager. So in practice, the way this actually flows is that the user will declare their intent. So the intent actually looks a lot like a stateful set. So an LI stateful set essentially is a mix of some native Kubernetes schemas and some LinkedIn specific concepts. So for instance, we have probes, affinity, um, but we do have some flavors on top of these things. Um, and then we do have, for instance, you do see we do accept an ACM endpoint. We do have to know how to talk to your ACM. And then we, say, we ask for your instance counts, uh, your, your version, uh, container version, your config version. And then from there, we will then generate a revision. So this is the step where we actually take what the user has declared. We'll take the mix of LinkedIn-specific concepts, the 
some of the Kubernetes native schemas that have been declared, and we will transform it into a, a pod template, essentially. And so this is an immutable payload that will eventually land in the, in the cluster. From this revision, we then stage the revision. And so this is where we say, hey, you have declared you want two instances of this pod running. And so we're going to stage that. And this is where we, we stage it. And then we use this to actually do diff generation. So most of the, the meat of the operator is in this step where essentially we take what has been staged and we diff it against the stateful pod. And the diff of that is essentially the, the uh, operation that we generate. So in this case, we have two pods declared. We check the world, and we don't see any stateful pods being found. And so we haven't found any pods, so let's generate an operation. This is a scale out. And so this will be sent to the ACM for an acknowledgment. ACM will acknowledge, and then once ACM acknowledges, does its safety checks, um, we will then actually create what we call a stateful pod. This pod is sort of the last mile, the stateful pod essentially is last mile delivery, where it's actually going to go create the persistent volume claims. It may massage the pod template a little bit, um, and then it will essentially create the pod. At this point, everything is done. So this is sort of the view from an operator, the operator developer. Um, but from the perspective of an ACM, they don't really see any of this. So ACM sort of just deals with the operations, right? Operations have a very simple life cycle where they sit in pending. And we will not do anything until we receive an acknowledgment from the ACM. So we can say, hey, I want to scale out. And then ACM goes down. We will not do anything. You can say, I want to do, do, do a deployment. We will not actually do a deployment because if we do not receive an acknowledgment, we don't know if it's safe to do it or not. So at any given point, a single pod could be under the effect of multiple different um, operations at once. So for example, I could say I want to scale out an instance, and then right after, I'm going to try and do a deployment. And then right after that, I'm going to try and take the node away for host lifecycle maintenance. So the operator doesn't actually prescribe any order to these. So to the perspective of the operator, an ACM is actually a man-in-the-middle attacker. So we can have In-N-Out Hamburger ACM acknowledging things in any order at once. They can say, I want to deploy to a pod that doesn't exist. We will gladly take it. We can say, hey, I want to scale down something that doesn't, that doesn't exist. We will gladly take it. And so to us, we, we are always in the business of reconciling and making sure that the LI stateful set does converge. Even if the ACM does crazy stuff, we're at LinkedIn, so most of the ACMs are very well behaved. But you know, sometimes maybe there's a moment of inspiration on the ACM side, and we'll see some crazy stuff. Um, so essentially, from the perspective of an ACM, you just declare your intent, and then you will receive one of these five operations with the metadata associated with the operation, so what pods are being affected. And then you know, we are always heart beating the state of the operation, so you will see where you sit in this life cycle. So you will know every five seconds, is it acknowledged? Is the operation running? Is the pod, is the pod actually running? Um, has the operation finished? So this is a high-level overview of the state machine that we're doing here for the operations. So one of the really big goals here was actually coordinating host lifecycle maintenance, because we have such a large fleet, and a lot of nodes will go down. We want to do OS upgrades. And so we really wanted to make it seamless to actually do um, host lifecycle maintenance on top of Kubernetes today. So today at LinkedIn, we do different types of maintenance. So we contend typically with, most of the time, temporary node loss. So if you're doing an OS upgrade, firmware upgrade, Kubla upgrade, or a top of the rack switch upgrade, this is typically temporary node loss. So node will go away for 30 minutes. It should come back. Data will still be preserved. Mount, mount points will still be preserved. And then we can just bring the pod right back up onto that node. In more drastic cases, either we're going to decommission a node or the node is, we detect it's chronically unhealthy, we will actually uh, attempt to swap your node out. So we don't actually tell them, tell our applications, we're taking this node away from you. We we'll always give them another node so that they can continue um, serving data, uh, serving their data very safely. So we have a whole maintenance stack at LinkedIn. I'm not going to go too much into the specifics here, but essentially, deep in our maintenance stack, we have a maintenance orchestrator and a host health, um, host health remediation service. So if there is a planned maintenance or a um, host issue that we believe is very light and can be remediated with a remage, we essentially will initiate a, what we call a disruption. So a disruption essentially is a request to actually evict 
on workload temporarily from Kubernetes. So deep in the infrastructure layer, we will initiate the disruption. That is the source of truth. It is then proxied essentially all the way up from our compute management later to the hub cluster and then all the way to the work cluster. Once we receive it in the stateful operator at this point, we will actually ask ACM for permission. Once we get permission, we proxy it all the way back up. Oh, sorry. We'll proxy it all the way back, and then the re-image will actually happen. If it is a temporary node loss situation, we will actually get the node back um, and bring the workload back. If it is a permanent node loss, if it's a chronic health issue, the node will just leave Kubernetes. It's going to surgery. Uh, we will never see it again, and we don't care. Um, OK, now let's look at some like uh, examples to see how the maintenance works for both temporary no loss and permanent no loss. Uh, so for temporary no loss, uh, let's say we want to re-image a node. Uh, so basically, the first step is uh, the infrastructure as a service platform sends the re-image request to the stateful operator. The stateful operator then creates a disruption request with the target pod and send the operation to the ACM. Uh, so those are the steps one and two in the diagram. So I uh, just want to uh, explain a little bit about like why a disruption is created. It's because the node will be returned back once the re-image is done, and the data is preserved across the re-image. OK, uh, in the ACM, uh, after receiving the disruption operation, oh, can I go back? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, from the ACM side, uh, after it receives the disruption operation, it will take some actions and eventually provide the acknowledgement uh, to the stateful operator. The stateful operator then can terminate the pod, the target pod, and then approve the re-image request to the infrastructure as a service platform. So these are the step three, four, and five in the diagram. Next, please. Yeah, so uh, let's look into ACM to see what actually happens there. So after receiving the disruption, the first thing that ACM does is safety check. So basically, the operation is safe only if taking down the target pod does not cause under-replicated partition, uh, under-replicated res resources. So in the example uh, uh, in the slide, um, pod two cannot be taken down. Why? Because at this moment, Resource two in the green rectangle, it only has two replicas. If we take power two down, that means we leave only one single replica of resource two, which is not safe. So, uh, uh, so in this case, the ACM, uh, the, the safety check does not pass, and the DCM does not give acknowledgement to the stateful operator. Uh, therefore, the stateful operator keeps rescinding the disruption operation to ACM. Let's say uh, after some time, uh, the application cluster recovers. So now all resources have uh, three replicas. It is safe to bring down pod two. So the safety check passes. ACM will uh, actually shift traffic away from the target pod. In this case, pod two. Uh, if you see the diagram, like all the resources on the pod two is grayed out, means the traffic is shifted away, but data is still kept. So this is the time that ACM gives, uh, gives acknowledgement to the stateful operator. So uh, let's say after some time, uh, the re-image is done. The infrastructure as a service platform notifies the stateful operator, OK, the re-image is done. The stateful operator then recreates the pod on the exact same node and then notifies ACM. Finally, ACM re-enables uh, the traffic back on the node, and the whole flow of the temporary node loss is done. Uh, yeah, that is for the uh, case of temporary node loss. Uh, so what about permanent node loss? So uh, let's say we want to decommission a node. At this time, first step is the, pretty much the same. The infrastructure uh, as a service platform sends the decommission request to the stateful operator. The stateful operator creates a swap operation in this case. It basically, it wants to uh, replace pod one with pod five and send the swap operation to ACM. So those are the step one and two in the diagram. So after receiving the swap operation, ACM again, it does something magically. 
Uh, but like, unlike the temporary no loss case, um, ACM does not acknowledge the whole swap operation in one go. Instead, it first acknowledges the, the addition of the new pods. Uh, after that, the stateful operator will start a pod on, a, on the replacement node. On the replacement nodes, so that is the step uh, three and four in the diagram. Once the new pod is up and running, ACM will again do something itself and then provide acknowledgement of the removal of the old pod. Following that, the stateful operator can terminate the old pod and provide approval to the infrastructure as a service platform. Okay, now the target node can be decommissioned. Those are the step uh, five, six, and seven, I believe, in diagram. Uh, so let's take a look at like what uh, happens in ACM. So uh, as we just covered, like basically the ACM first acknowledged the addition of the new pod. So the new pod is up and running at this moment. Uh, the new pod has no data. The, the data is still on the old pod. So then ACM triggers data movement from the old pod to the new pod. Like in our example, it is from pod one to pod five. Uh, okay. um, let's say after some time the data movement is done, the old pod, pod one, has no data. It is the time that the old pod can be removed from the application cluster, and the ACM does that. Uh, it unregisters the old pod from the application cluster manager, and this is the time uh, when the ACM can provide acknowledgement of the removal of the old pod. Uh, okay, next. Yeah, basically ACM removes the old pod from the application cluster manager and acknowledges. Okay, yeah, I think that is the whole point of uh, both uh, that is uh, two examples of both temporary and permanent no loss. So uh, as you can see from those examples, it's clear that like with the stateful operator and ACM framework, uh, application teams, they, don't, they only need to focus on uh, application specific logics like selecting, preparing, and uh, finalizing operations. They don't need to worry about like how uh, the infrastructure as a service platform works. They don't need to be expert in Kubernetes. So I think that's one of the whole points of the initiative. So some of the lessons we learned uh, doing this journey in the last year was that we were able to get pretty far on Kubernetes. I mean, just using Kube Scheduler and Kubelet alone was pretty incredible value. Having CSI driver and being able to like provide new storage options for the operator in just a very seamless interface, which is persistent volume claim, was incredibly powerful for us. Um, in terms of operators, um, operators are an ongoing challenge for us, especially for our very, very workflow heavy operator. Modeling status as a workflow and the observability of an operator is pretty challenging. If I could go back in time, I probably would have done this on a workflow engine like Temporal or Airflow. Um, but I think you know, we still have made it work on uh, Operator. In terms of actually creating a solution for everyone, it's pretty hard to give everyone a single entity that does everything they want. Today, Espresso says they want to do this one thing. Tomorrow, another team comes and says, hey, I want to be able to add this environment variable to this specific thing. And as time goes on, the scope of an LI stateful set slowly starts to look more like a native pod template. And so we want to avoid the scope creep and make things fairly succinct, um, but we also want to be fairly flexible. And the last point is that if you do decide to undertake a journey like this, um, in general, it's a good practice to minimize the number of ACMs in the wild. The protocol that we have is much more complex than what the talk alluded to. Um, there's a lot of stages. And so just as a general principle, the less moving parts in your system, the better overall. And of course, this talk covered 1% of a lot of very, very hard work that has gone on um, at LinkedIn. Um, so for all the LinkedIn folks in the room, thank you to all of you. For everyone at home, wherever you are, thank you. Um, and at that point, it is now just, uh, if there's any questions, um, feel free to ask away.
Hey, thanks. I'm Sean from Airbnb. That was awesome. Are you, do you have any plans to open source the operator? If there is interest in open sourcing this, and if you guys feel like there's value, we will definitely consider. Right now, it's fairly, fairly LinkedIn heavy. Um, so it would need some love to make it usable. Oh. On the same, uh, same topic, any maybe improvement that you could push back to the um, to, um, native stateful sets? So one thing that we have discussed, and then it came up in the NVIDIA talk yesterday, is sort of making maintenance a first-class citizen. So if you look at a lot of the talks today, or even yesterday, everyone's, anyone running on-prem is doing some sort of disruption, some sort of maintenance where they want to evict. Having this be a first-class citizen in Kubernetes may hold a lot of value for workloads. I don't know if building this into something like stateful set is maybe appropriate. I think operator is better for this kind of business logic heavy stuff. I think stateful set is good for very simple things. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's questionable if this should be in, in stateful set or not. Stateful set maybe could support something like maintenance. Uh, but if, if it was going to be application aware, it probably should be something else. Um, so it seems like Kubernetes is not giving a lot of um, hooks where you can plug your uh, controls into, right? Like you want to do certain things, like talk to the ACMs before you create a pod or before you delete a pod. Um, would it be useful for Kubernetes core to provide, I don't know, like hooks for um, external handlers to control the eviction process? Yeah, I think. It could be useful if something lived in the scheduler lifecycle as a scheduler plugin. That is probably an appropriate hook. So if we were to make this native, it could be something the scheduler, essentially, where you cooperate with the scheduler. Um, it's a little bit more seamless of an integration in one of the pre-filter stages, um, and, uh, or maybe not pre-filter, deeper, deeper down the line. Um, but it could be probably well-placed in the scheduler. OK? I think. Um, that is, if there's any other questions, you know, please feel free, come up and ask. Otherwise, you know, shameless plug, we are hiring, of course. Um, but yeah, otherwise, thank you all for attending.